um, so far this expedition. So Brian, without um, bed forms, can you tell what the current is? Nope. Thank you. <gasps> um, there's a couple things we can look at in terms of on certain taxa of corals, they line up with the current. Um, and uh, so my assumption is the current is more or less coming downhill here. If you look at all the fans are kind of pointed in an uphill direction. So I would assume that the uh, predominant current is coming out of uh, and coming towards the vehicle right now. You can kind of see that whip moving a little bit, probably getting bounced around by the current a bit. And since Herc is looking more or less due south, I would say the current is coming out of the, the south here. But as I've been lamenting um, several times on this expedition is we don't have a good way to measure currents on science ROVs. Uh, it's just not a sensor that's kind of considered standard. Um, and I very much would like to see more science class ROVs coming with um, upward looking um, acoustic Doppler current profilers or Doppler velocity logs um, to allow us to do a better job of, of actually quantifying the current. Also, be very helpful for the ROV operators to manage the vehicles in the tender. So yeah. So a couple more rock pins here. A couple more Paramarissi day. Another urchin. This whip here, please. Sure. Oh, actually, that little red thing over there on the left is an anthemastus. Uh -huh. Push in there, yeah. Got a little baby Eritogorgia here on the left as well. It's got an associate with it. Looks like a little shrimp. Yep. Not sure what this whip is yet. Push it uh, a little bit more. That's good. We'll come closer. Come down just a couple meters for us. Yeah, this is a bamboo. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, you can go wide, thanks. And can we take a close look at that cup coral and maybe sample it? Oh, yeah. And hello to our colleagues in Scotland who are all at the International Com Symposium for Deep Sea Corals. We have, I feel like, I feel like everyone who's not at sea right now who does deep sea coral work is in Edinburgh, Scotland for the week. Steve in Scotland too? Yep.
Oh, come on. So some loose rocks there. I'm trying to find a perch. Oh, uh, you can push in there, Daryl, while I'm flailing around here. Steve, since you're watching, do you do you know what this is, and is it potentially worth sampling? We haven't gotten any cup corals yet this expedition. Okay, you can go uh, go take there. That falls in. Roger. I haven't got to try the slurp yet. Yep, let's go ahead and take this as a sample. Roger. And yes, I think slurping is your best bet. So, how is the rubber band still attached, but there's something in the jar? Can you uh, rotate around to the plush jar for us? Copy that. Just a little more jam on the vehicle here. Okay, you have the flush jar. Right there. Uh, you can turn it on and um, push out the hose there for us. So Corley, uh, before we came on the ship, there was some interesting rocks being found. Do you know anything about those interesting rocks? Yeah, it looks like Kevin Conrad, um, who is Amber Serval's graduate advisor, was interested in collecting a rock here. And apparently they have red chunks on them? I have no idea. Okay. I don't know anything about the sample. When I came on shift, Sarah talk to me about corals. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but they got a rock just as we walked in the door. Okay. Okay, you can uh, go to a jar that doesn't have any samples in it. I mean, just the next jar there. You got this. These. For the, for the ID. How high do you want the suction, Dan? Uh, change jars. Which jar? I don't know. What's What jar is open? Seven. Chris? Go counterclockwise, reverse. Copy. Uh, any jar except five is open. Okay. Turn it on there. Does it look super clean? How much suction do you want? Uh, go 75. Copy that. IT4 is at 75. You want a cleaner jar there? Are you happy with that one? That's fine. And do. There he goes. Whoop. And now the long wait, looking at the jar camera to see how if it makes it into the jar. There it is. Oh. Turn off. Okay. Success. I T four set zero. And go back to uh, flash, please. Copy. And what sample number? That was sample 095. 095 cup coral and uh, jar 7. <laughs> well, how not to put your slurp away. You want me to retract the porch? Um. 
Hey, Curry track. Copy. To the viewer online, I am glad that we are better than a root canal. Thanks for listening to us as you recover. It's fully retracted. Go ahead, Neff. Zero, nine, four was a medium sized angular rock. Uh, Roger, stand by. That porch all the way retracted, is it? Indeed it is. All right. And we're off. Can I switch to back to the rail cam for me? Copy that. You've got the rail cam. Thank you. Tab data. Okay, I got uh, latitude is nine decimal three four seven. Longitude negative one six three decimal one nine seven. You're welcome. Uh, 093 was a Niskin sample. <laughs> Not to be confused with a coral. Couple more paramecids here. Some kind of Coralidae. Can we look at the center pink? Right there. Let's try to uh, get my DSC and my Zeus lined up here. Push in there, there. Good, thanks. Push in just a bit more for me. Good. So I believe this is a Coralidae on the left. A per, uh, Paragorgia in the center, and then a Primnoa, uh, not Primnoa, excuse me, uh, Paramercy on the left. But when we start seeing these co-occurring Coralidae's, um, I start getting cautious about Paragorgias unless I see them moving. All right, thank you. Okay, you can go ahead. The kind of definitive way to tell the Paragorgias away apart from the Coralids is that the Coralids have a hard skeleton and a brittle, and the Paragorgias are of a proteinaceous skeleton <coughs> and are pretty flexible. So if you see it moving, it's a, a really dis good way to distinguish the two families. Brian, we have a question. What is um, the reproductive difference between shallow water sponges and deep water sponges? I honestly don't know. I think we know so very little about reproduction of deep water critters in general, sponges even less so than corals, that I am not sure. 
Awesome, thank you. Hey, Daryl, can you do um, H11 uh, sled Zeus? you want the uh, bubble cam there. That's fine. Yeah, he, um, we have a button for that one up here. Yeah. I did, I did, yeah, with this set up, I don't have to, I look up I look at that camera all the time, but I have to look at the top monitors, which uh, the way it's set up now, I don't have to. I still do because they're bigger view, but after four hours, I'll have a pain in the neck. get whiplash this way. All right, well, I think we've <coughs> probably got a pretty good sense of what's here in tether length. Shall we get, is the ship underway? No, I'm uh, moving uh, to the uh, northeast. So we got quite a bit of ways to move northeast. When I get to the end of that, then I'm okay. just going to, we'll do a small step. That sounds good. If you want to keep the zigzag pattern that Mike had there. Yeah. It's kind of moving back and forth on the hill and then yep. going up go. at each uh, switchback. Go ahead, Nav. 92. Yes. Was a Hemicorallian fan. Come down just a couple meters for me. Copy that. I'm paying out. Brian, we have another question. So the way that shallow water coral okay. do broadcast spawning, has that ever been witnessed in the deep sea? I can go back and change that later. I don't know of Step an example of it being witnessed, it. but that does definitely does not mean it hasn't been. Copy. I know that it, it's thought uh, a fair number of brooders and actually be hold better. their larvae um, and have one short range five. dispersal, and others have um, longer range six. dispersal. But I think we know very, very little about it. Awesome. Thank you. And we have no idea if there, there's timed releases or anything like that, like you have in, in shallow water. Yeah. Time to uh, switch back. Let me look at this one, please. I think it's just a metallic orgia, but yeah. I can't quite tell from this distance. Go ahead and push in there now. Sorry, I'm too far away. Come down five for me. Yeah, that's, that's a metallic orgia. Thanks.
What are those kind of bluish looking yeah, ones? Those in the look back? like Victorgias. This is a pretty, the density of coral here is not super high. I mean, it's better than we've been seeing in the last couple of dives, but it's a pretty di pretty diverse community. We've got five or six different families represented um, and multiple genuses within each family. And Steve, if, I don't know how long they're watching, but they did get an eDNA sample when they first got into this band. Unique question. Do cephalopods have ears? Like, can they hear? Off the top of my head, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either. All right, Dr. Google. Can we zoom on the pink whip moving into center? Yeah, go ahead. And yes, cephalopods can detect sound, but they do it using their stat assist. And it's typically only low frequency sounds. All right, that's good for us, thanks. This is a black coral, black whip. Okay, go ahead. Couple of them here. Hi, Alexis. Hi, back. Yep, all the deep sea coral biologists are all in Scotland looking <laughs> over Steve's shoulder right now. <laughs> That's so fun. Another five force. What is this uh, conference called? International Symposium on Deep Sea Corals. Got another little cup coral here, probably a Giovannia. Get another um, 20 when you get a chance on it. Is that a dead something? Down at the bottom, yeah. Zoom on the uh, skeleton there. Yep, dead skeleton, probably something Coraliday. There's one little brittle star on it. All right, thank you. Okay. Brian, have you ever been to a coral festival in the Maldives? I wish. <laughs> No, I've never been in the Indian Ocean. 
A viewer on online says that there is a very great choral festival in the Maldives, and Dr. Callum Roberts was in attendance. Willem in the Netherlands says that one day we will be able to communicate with our choral friends and have representatives at the choral communities. <laughs> There's a fish off to the left, probably a cuskiel hiding under that uh, overhang. Nice rock though, look at all the different life on this rock. Yeah. Delta and it's zero, about to right. get better. Yay, so much diversity. You hit, you're too close. That's a diverse little patch. There's a multiple black corals, multiple crallids. Zoom in on the uh, Herc there if you want, Daryl. With, uh, sorry, with uh, Atlanta. Come up just nice and easy, five meters. Those are so pretty. It's an Atlanta shot there. <coughs> yep. Yeah. I don't know, Katie, you want to flag that Atlanta shot for a highlight? I sure can. I love flagging shots. Okay, you can zoom out of it there. Freaking right out. <laughs> Can we get a closer look at any of these yellow, like yellow or yellow, bright yellows? This one, this one, or this one? Yeah, right there. Get the one on the, come around the rock here. Get the one on the left. I'm going to uh, tilt down a bit when you get a chance. All right there. Push in there, don't. I don't know what this is, Steve. What is this bright yellow thing? Push in just a bit more for us. A little bit more. Might as well zoom in there. Is this some type of analysamia? Okay, yeah. Yep. Steve agrees. So this is a new one for, I think, this expedition. We haven't seen any of these. This is actually a true sclerotinian. Um, and then we'd like to take a look at the um, squat lobster back in the le to the left, if we can, that was behind the lighter pink. It's hiding back there. 
and then this other one that it's hiding behind might be Madripoora. So we're suddenly suddenly come into a little cluster of, of um, actual sclerotinians or colonial sclerotinians. We've been seeing the cup corals. Okay, zoom in there. Can you check the lights and see if Mike has a pen and tilt on? Copy. Is that full zoom or can we get any closer on the squat lobster? You can, uh, should have some more zoom there. Your pan tilt light is off right now. Right. It. That's Max. All right, so. I'm getting pretty close, Dan. Yeah, you can come up. All right, that's good. Thank nice you. And, and so this is, this is actually up. an album. I'm not Chris, not Madrivora. Uh, you get on the zoom, are you? Yeah, we can, we're done here. Okay, you can go wide down. So yeah, this is definitely, this section of seamount so far is the, by far the highest diversity can coral community we've seen yet in this expedition. Tilt down. Copy that. And there's a primnoid in there too. And a couple more cup corals. Okay, you have delta 10. Seen it. Zoom in there for a sec for me. Personal favorite thing. Well, one of. Okay, good, thanks. You can now uh, go wide again, thanks. So these big colonial sclerotinians we're seeing here are um, pretty t sensitive to oxygen we're, see we're finding. So oxygen here is on the lower side, but not um, too, too low. We're at 67 uh, micromoles per liter. And wow, they just like suddenly picked up all the anomalous here. Look at the basket star right on the lasers. Yep, go ahead, push in there, Daryl. These are a personal favorite of mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's good, thank you. Okay, you can go wide. So, are the basket stars ancient like the corals are? Or? I, don't, I don't think they're as old now but I also am not sure we know that either. Sorry, Steve, I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Yeah, actually, we have not see, gotten a look at one of those yet this dive. Can we take a, can you get in that spot safely? Yeah, totally. Then, then, yeah, let's take a quick look at that one. Oops. Watch out for that manipulator. I wish I had my stereo cameras on for this. It'd be an awesome uh, 3D model. Okay, 
can uh, push in there a bit. Let me come just a little closer as well. Yeah, I can go ahead and push in. So we've got a crowd today, probably a hemicrallium over here on the right, and an Elam Samia here on the left, and uh, Victor Gorgia hiding in the center here. I really like the bright purple one. Yeah, and that's the Victor Gorgia. I should do this a little more if you want there. All right, science is happy. Okay, you can go one. Yeah, look at that. That's that's impressive in terms of uh, diversity of corals. It can uh, come up five if you want, and then talk down for me. Copy. And we'd like to uh, take a Niskin here, but if you can put us like dead center in the cluster of corals, kind of close and trigger it, that would be appreciated. Can do. Uh, dead center in the top, or kind of where I'm at now? Uh, move If you can get over a little to the right, cl closer to the tall things. Yeah, can do. That's probably good in here. Right, yeah. So we've got an Aridogorgia here, a couple more whips. Looks like a Metallogorgia. Bamboo whips, more of these Paramaricias. A couple different types of black corals. So we're going to capture a water sample here um, for um, environmental DNA analysis. with our collaborators at uh, Pacific Northwest Fisheries Science Center and Boston University. Zoom in there for a second if you want. There. Nice shot on the still camera while we're sitting here. Yes. You uh, turn on the pen and tilt light. Copy that. You have the pan tilt light. All right. Okay, can uh, go wide for us, please. Let's see, uh, looks 
Looks which like bottles have been dripped. Looks like three, four, and five. Four, five, and six are open. Uh, nope. One, two, three, and four are open. One, two, three, and four. was a previous tradition video called uh, three, two, one, Niskin, in a kind of NASA countdown fashion. Now what's the sample number? Sample is 096. All right. Sample 096 is an eDNA sample with a high diverse di diversity community, multiple paramercy of multiple blacks, multiple chorality, in Alapsamia and multiple Chrysogorgia. And cup corals. Can we check out the associates on the Cerrita Gorgia Dead Center? Looks like it's got multiple uh, Let's tenants. See, uh, we had a common name for the Cerrita Gorgia. I forget what it was. Might have been a made up one. I don't know. Firework coral. Push in a bit there for us, there. So we got one shrimp, and looks like several anemones. The anemones are what I was seeing that I couldn't tell what they were. Were you hoping it was going to be one of those jellies? Yep, a little bit. But I don't see any home. All right, that's good for us. Thank you. Steve thinks that shrimp might have been a bathy um, paleomanella. Can you turn off the pen and tilt light, please? Copy that. It's off. Steve, aren't you supposed to be at a conference, like doing conference things? <laughs> Not that we don't appreciate the help. Coffee break. What day is your presentation, Steve? This is also one of those fun telepresence things where we have people working from 11 hour time zone difference helping us out here at 5 a.m. Well, it's 4 or 5 p.m. in Scotland. Uh, congratulations, I'm glad the presentation went well. It's always nice when your presentation is early in the conference and then you get it over with and can kind of enjoy the conference more. Yeah, my presentation is supposed to be on a Monday, so I'm very excited about that. So it's interesting to note that, like, complete absence here of sponges in this um, spot. 
I think there's a sponge there. I imagine there's probably, I'm sure if we went back and look at it in detail, we'll find one or two small ones. Um, What's that guy there? It's a big sponge. Yep. <laughs> but off the rock and not Where looking it? like it's doing all that well. Sorry, I spotted him. I was zooming over there just well, when you said that. That's actually what made me think about it was I saw that sp the sponge uh, stalk and I was like, wait, there hasn't been any other sponges. Yeah, it's kind of a solitary sponge. It looks kind of dead. Yep, but it does not look like it's in good shape. I think this used to be a Walteria, but it's definitely not doing well. Slash, maybe dead or completely dead. All right, that's good. Thank you. You know, some are uh, some are white when they're alive, and some are that dark color from the uh, sediment. I don't try to breathing. think of. I'm trying to think of a good kind of rule of thumb, and I don't really have it for you. But some some taxa cover themselves in kind of sediment and hold it, and some don't. And I'm, if that's a Walteria, they definitely don't. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's look at the prim. No, it, we have not seen gotten a good look at these yet. Right. Can, uh, push in there a bit for us. Keep coming closer. Steve, what's the genus on this one? This is this is a primnoid, and I always get hesitant to call these things to the genus level. I think it's Clyptotrophora. Yeah. Yep, it is. Thanks, Steve. We've got a couple associates here. It looks like a bunch of brittle stars, shrimp, some kind of hydrozoans overgrowing it. All right, thank you. We're good. Okay. South. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, that is totally lateral. Uh, she's drifting that way anyways, so... Yeah, yeah. So many choices. Actually, spun, let's look, since I just commented, yeah, so you say, since sponges have been rare, let's go. Um, Right. Look at the sponge. So over the past 30 minutes, the oxygen concentration has been increasing as we've been coming shallower. Um, and the water temperature has actually been decreasing I mean, fractionally, but it's definitely a trend. Um, and we are just about 
right at right around 1500 meters here push in a bit there go. Uh, push in a bit more we've got a stalked glass sponge here with uh, a rock pen All right, that's probably good enough, thanks. Okay, I can go wide, thanks. Take a look at the yellow one, please. Sure. This should be another Enolap Samia, I believe. Light years away here. Semi Crowley on on the right. I always love how they they seem to grow down and kind of fit the texture of the rocks around them. And I can uh, push in there. Oh. Yeah, this is definitely a colonial sclerotinian. Probably in Elapsamia, but sometimes Madripora screws me up. But that's good enough for us, thanks. Okay, can go in. Another nice basket star here on this Corral day. See here, it's a black background. We're seeing a lot more of these. Oh, sorry. Corley, do you have like auto, what's your auto exposure on that? They look like they're coming out hot to me. Are you setting it yourself or? Better? Yeah. Uh, push in there, don't. What is that? Oh. Yeah, look how perfectly it mirrors the texture of the rock it's growing on. I've seen these sometimes in little crev crevices and holes that just perfectly fill um, the crevice between two rocks and make like a perfect strainer. Push in there a bit more. Okay, probably go full in there. Hello there, Old Corey Middle School. Yeah, we missed you on your 445 interaction, but we got you slated for 545 coming up. Just the, the arms on these things just amaze me. I mean, think about the neurological control in order to control so many different arms moving all um, simultaneously, potentially. Like, I mean, I believe these things have a distributed neural um, structure, and so the arms are kind of in their own way a little independent, but it still kind of amazes me to think about um, a somewhat simple organism that has the control of so many different independent arms over such a large area compared to its body size. That's a good point. <coughs> Here comes the dust cloud. All right, thank you. You can go white.
Corley, any interesting rocks so far? Any ones that you want to add to your own personal rock collection? Uh, not particularly. <laughs> Well, I'm loath to say it because this has been a really awesome spot. We probably just thinking of time should be making a little more concerted up effort Fair. uphill. <laughs> Except for that sponge, which we or that's not a sponge, is it? No, that's coral. Never mind. Unless we still got a kilometer or so to cover before. 9 a.m. ship time. And we're set to recover at 10 a.m.? Yeah, so we'll have to leave the bottom. Yeah, by 9. Plus or minus an hour after, or before that. That's our first stalked crinoid I've seen in this higher abundance um, kind of coral zone. Can you come down five? And we don't really need to take a look at the, the crinoid. Just right. noting that that we've seen a lot of crinoids um, this expedition so far. And they Tilt seem to moment. be often in areas where we're not seeing a lot of corals. The crinoids kind of dominate. And here in this area that's dominated by all kinds of different corals, we're seeing a um, you know, huge drop in the number of crinoids. The two dives, three dives ago, at the same depth, we were just in a forest of crinoids um, with very few corals. And here it's kind of the uh, inverse. Looks like it's going to flatten out here a bit at the top, so... At least for a minute. See which way the current's blowing now. Our tether is. Uh, you think you're straight bow into it? Yeah, I think so. So you got a moderate to strong current coming out of uh, one four five, which is lined up exactly with the broad faces of the corals. But yeah. The neutral tether, neutrally buoyant tether is, is definitely pushed out far. Bridge nav. Can we move two zero meters one three five, please? Thank you. Ooh, a redagorgia. Yeah. Look at and look how much it's moving. The current is ripping. All the all the corals are are moving in the wind. Man, right. there's a lot of corals up on this spot. This all ridge. kinds of different. Yeah, yeah. This is a really interesting spot. Can we take a closer look at this one, please? Sure. Uh, 
position there, but. Is that a Venus flytrap anemone? That's looks like uh, it. It's certainly an anemone. Yeah. Yep. It, but I'm really struggling as to what this coral is. Go it looks like one of go. those weeping willows. The tree? Uh, yeah. Uh, it does have like a tree-like quality, like to me, like a tree losing its leaves in the fall. Got a couple of associates on it. Yeah, it's got a lot of associates. It's got amphipods, it's got little yeah. shrimps, it's got brittle stars, it's got this anemone. Um, it's loaded down. Looking at how thin those branches are to see that big old anemone on top. Yeah, can we look down towards the base, please? Right. This looks a lot like the thing we collected yesterday that I was calling a hydroid colony, but this would be like really big for that. Look. Oh, okay. Now I see it. Yeah. When we were looking at the top of it, I didn't see it, and I was like, I don't want to tell you. Like, no, I don't agree. It's mostly from this angle. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think this is going to have to remain a mystery until I do some digging through the guides. Cause I'm really not sure what this is, unless it's a hydroid that's fully encased uh, corallium skeleton. All right, thank you. Okay, go away, thanks. Chloe, can you scroll down on this one? I can't. Okay. I didn't think so, but I, I don't have control check. over that computer. Yeah. That's just the view. I didn't think so, I just wanted to double check. What do you want to see? Uh, pressure at that depth. 14. Just a field of hemichorallium here with some NLAPSAMIA mixed in. Ooh, that's a good Atalanta shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as, as we're moving through this um, just really impressive um, coral field. It's a good time to remind people that the area we're operating in right now is uh, part of the U.S. exclusive economic zone uh, north of the U.S. territories of Palmyra and Kingman Reef. And uh, this area currently is under consideration for a proposed national marine sanctuary. Um, and the public comment period to get um, people's input closes, I believe, June 2nd. Uh, and the link is on Nautilus Live, um, and there's a write-up on nautiluslive.org about what that means and, and ways to participate. Um, but this is a really relevant time period for us to be here um, collecting this data, which is going to get fed right into um, the federal decision-making process about whether this area should qualify as uh, a new national marine sanctuary. all those beautiful corals. Yeah, all the colors, the pinks and the yellows. And yeah, this is like perfect for an Easter card. Easter is prime time for all the pastel colors. 
turn off uh, Argus's lights for a second. It's reflecting in the DSC. Thank you. So we are currently at 1,460, 50 meters. So for pressure, that's going to be 14,500-ish pascals, okay, 100 turn them back on. 45 bars, 143 atmospheres. I think we'll be good for another 20, 135. Okay. You might need to come up a little. Bridge now. Stay in double digits. Can we have another move to zero meters, 135, please? Thank you. Before the ship gets moving, can we take a quick look at that one, please? Yeah, right. Oh, it's another one of those brown ones. Yeah, I think this is another one of the black corals we saw earlier, but I just want Go to ahead, confirm. Okay. It's that same black coral we were seeing earlier. It might be trisopathies. All right, thank you. Okay, I can go wide, thanks. So at this depth, are there any floating tenophores? Or are they all benthic tenophores that attach onto the corals? Oh yeah, we can definitely see um, free swimming tenophores down here. Certainly, some. I haven't seen any yet, have you? No, uh, not down here. We saw a lot on the Blue Water Express yeah. um, on our last shift. But no, we haven't. I haven't seen much of any um, water column life down here. We saw that one. Uh, octopus for like all of three seconds a couple of days ago um, but no for the most part we've seen very little um, life in the water column and that coral is like two meters across it's massive and if you look in the Atalanta view you can see that it's as wide as Hercules is if not wider holy moly you're right Tilt down just a little. Further. There you go. Look at the size of the base of the one in the middle. It's overgrowing that entire rock. You know, good for the coral. It's really nice. We don't have to look at the ugly rock. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Question online for you, Brian. Are any of these deep sea corals being affected by climate change, bleaching, ocean acidification, crown of thorn, sea stars? These are definitely for not bleached. For the most part, yes. Um, this, these areas are definitely not immune to the effects of climate change. Um, bleaching isn't a problem here because they don't have photosymbionts they can expel, uh, and crown of thorns don't come down this deep. But uh, temperature change and ocean acidification 100% will affect uh, these organisms. So the yellow ones we're seeing here are um, true sclerot or clonial sclerotinians, and they have to lay uh, a calcium carbonate skeleton down. And they're very, very limited, especially in the deep sea, uh, or by pH. And so if the pH starts ticking down, which it is, mm -hmm. down here, they're going to really struggle very quickly to continue to make skeletons and reduce their growth rate quite a bit. Um, the deep ocean is generally more acidic than the shallower water, uh, making it harder to make those skeletons in already. And so every little change in the pH down here is really going to um, hurt the couple sclerotin uh, clonial sclerotinians we see down here, the Anal Sammy and the Madripora. Um, will definitely be affected by ocean acidification. Um, and the modeling we have done, uh, we, I, I say that in the royal we as other researchers, um, 
looking at the habitat suitability based on temperature is showing some pretty dramatic shifts. Um, I was just working with some colleagues at Temple University a couple weeks ago looking at deep sea corals on the Blake Plateau off the coast of Georgia and South Carolina, um, which they're dominated by um, uh, a coral. It used to be Lophelia pertusa, now it's called Desmophila pertusa, um, that makes these big deep sea mounds, um, basically coral reefs. Um, they're reef building corals that exist in the deep sea. And some, if you look at some of the worst case climate projections that um, the where they live in the highest density is an area we call the Million Mounds area of the Blake Plateau. Um, that has over 20,000 uh, individual Desmophila mounds. And when I say individual, I mean a couple hundred meters in size and a couple hundred meters off the seafloor. That entire area um, by the end of the century could be inhospitable to them, and we could lose the highest density and largest continuous cold water coral uh, reef structure in the world wow. uh, may completely disappear. Um, by the end of the century? Yep. And that's mainly driven by temperature. So are there any ways that people at home can help fight ocean acidification? Yeah, I mean, it's, Put it's baking all... baking soda in the ocean? <laughs> That would have to be a lot. Um, it's all the, the kind of basic things that everyone knows they should be doing that are really hard to do sometimes. Uh, Such as like burning less fossil fuels, driving yeah. your car less. Yep, that. And, and really, I think the bigger impact is making good policy. Um, and as individuals should absolutely do what they can to transition to cleaner energy sources, more efficient ways of trans um, transportation being conscientious of, you know, the everyday life choices, but also, you know, advocating for larger political change and regulation and oversight um, that helps, you know, shift market forces to make some of these more environmentally friendly um, products and services and sources of things more cost uh, effective. And, and a lot of that's going to come from regulation and oversight, at least from my point of view. And so... There's, a, there's hundreds of ways to help reduce your carbon footprint and help guide society to a lower carbon um, environment. And we really need more people to put pressure on the decision makers through where you p spend your money, how you cast your votes, um, all the different ways. Yeah, I was gonna say like vote with your dollars. So don't be like informed about the corporations and the clothing brands and things that you're spending your money on because those people can be, um, a lot of those times those big corporations are very responsible for a lot of uh, pollution, especially in the ocean. But this is an epic coral community we're moving through here. This is unquestionably the, the best dive so far in terms of coral we've seen on this expedition. Oh, there's another great example of how this hemichorallium fills all the cracks right down near the um, sea floor. You can see this one in the center, how it's just kind of wrapped around this boulder face and has grown down till it met the rocks and has filled this gap. Um, is that because it's just so big it needs more support or it's... I don't know, honestly. When I've gotten in here and looked in these previously, which we can maybe do a little bit now, um, they're not actually touching. They oh. grow very close, and I think it has something to do with capturing the capturing the flow, um, the water flow moving around the rock face. Yes, I do, yeah. Come back around and put our nose in the breeze here, but let's trace it off to the uh, northeast here for a moment. Sure. We're going to have to jump off here at some point. All right, did you want to see that guy from the backside? Uh, it's right. a. Uh, it's right here. So. 
No, I think it's okay. I don't think we're going to get the same view from this angle. And mm -hmm. we don't. It's not a big deal. I'm sure we will see another example of it here. So I was just doing my, ch uh, my countdown checklist, and today is our halfway mark. Oh my god. Yeah. So, yeah, after today we will be um, having less and less days. It's like a little magical moment. What are you telling me? You're already tired and want to go home? Mm -hmm. Just when we find the like, corals? No. I, I know, would never, seriously. ever, ever want to like every moment I spend in this control van with y'all guys is a moment of heaven. <laughs> Who chose this dive? <laughs> Did you choose this dive, Brian? I don't think it, I don't think anyone ever chooses a dive. It's always a collaborative effort of several of us sitting around throwing out ideas and then refining each other's. The dive chooses you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was a good dive. This was a good dive. But Whale bell, what I really can't corals. tell you is why this dive was frankly all that different than the dive. The reason is because the dive the knows day. that the still camera is working now. <laughs> so it's like, okay, now that it's working, we're going to give you some things to photograph. I will say this depth range we did specifically target because we hadn't been um, at the deeper depths, but we haven't been in this 1400 meter window already, or 13 to 14. Um, but we hadn't done 2000 to 1600 or 1500. So we did specifically target this depth range because it was a gap in what we've seen so far on this expedition. I'm gonna have to uh, turn and look downhill a bit and Go forward, I can't, uh, I don't have the oomph to do that sideways there against the breeze. Okay. Um, which way is the ridge back? Can you see, can you see in the local topography which way is the ridge line up to the high? Uh, we're on top right now, so. Okay. Uh, but, uh, in Atlanta is looking, uh, to the uh, west uphill. To the west uphill? Yeah, right. There's a little local downhill. Oh, okay. Here. Then, yeah. Because I'm going to have to. I can come down the hill here and then spin back around. Yeah, you can also just. We, we can also just go downhill and it shouldn't be much of a downhill in theory because we're. In theory. So we should, be, we should be picking up another. 100 meters of elevation almost, or 60 meters, before we get to the top of this feature. And then we will have to go downhill. Uh, which way we'll take out the tether wrap? I don't yeah, that's the way we want to go. So we got an interesting question that just came in. So we've talked about deep sea mining. We've talked about renewable energy sources like solar and wind. What about tidal power generation? Can you come down? That is something I don't know that I much about, yeah. but I think I've um, heard about it, but I've never. I don't. I know think anything it's about actually it. supposed to be a pretty good method of renewable good, energy. Yeah, renewable, but I just. I haven't heard anybody putting it in. I haven't seen well, anything about it. Did you see the giant barge that was two ships in front of us at the pier when we got on underway? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was not paying attention, but... That was a tidal current generator system. So how does that work? It goes out on a ship? I thought it was like a little power plant kind of sitting there. There. This is not my area of expertise by any stretch of the imagination, but what I've seen 
many different designs and ideas for wave capture, tidal capture, current flow, um, and I don't think any of them have, they haven't settled on an ideal design. They're, mm -hmm. in, they're in that st stage where there's a whole wide range of divergent ideas of how to do it best, and really only recently are we seeing large-scale field tests like the one that they're doing in Hawaii. Um, I misspoke there earlier, Brian. I was looking at the wrong sonar. So uphill is uh, east. Ah, that I makes get more those, sense. I get those backwards. Over. Okay. That makes more sense Just to me. turned around there. But we will have to go downhill in the not too distant future. Right. Um, so I think from a n renewable energy standpoint, it is a very renewable energy. The catch being is um, having to deploy large things in strong currents to make it work. And that provides its own whole host of challenges. But there are certainly several groups that I'm aware of that are, are experimenting with trying to find a way to do um, tidal right. and the current beast. and wave capture. Yeah. There's a metallic orgia here. Bridge nav. And just all of a sudden like that, we find Can we move two zero meters with, east, please? With much fewer corals. Thank you. So speaking of fewer corals, we have a question that just came in. Um, and it's going back to last week's dive saying that there was a stretch of dead corals and like a lot of coral skeletons. Was a lack of oxygen there the cause of the dead corals? Um, I honestly don't remember that. It might have been on a different watch. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but you do sometimes see these areas where the corals seem to have all died off and I'm not sure we have a... a um, definitive answer. A definitive answer on that. And saying hello to more friends in Scotland. Hi, Amanda. So we got a bathopathies here, probably another Enopsamia. So we're getting back into the thicker corals here after a little departure down the saddle there and got out of the current flow, is my guess. Um, can we look at sponge, please? Sure. Mm, go ahead, Daryl. Can, can you bring up Chris Kelly's wish list of sponges? Yep. Be a little current here. Oh no, never mind. That's <laughs> nice. Okay. Yes. I go uh, tight there, do Shrimp. Okay, thanks. Shrimp slash sponge. Cool. Little shrimp. So we got a shrimp living on a, a glass sponge. Look at the current. Yeah, that uh, really is ripping. ripping. Okay, Looks like a white morph away. Paragorgia with a Paramaricia. Can we look at this one before we take off too? Sure. Uh, the primnoids here are hidden in and around. They're definitely not dominant here, but there's <laughs> several hanging around. All right, that's probably good enough. Okay. Thank you. And I got a Victor Gorgia back there. Man, the diversity here is awesome. We're seeing just about every major coral taxa that uh, um, exists in this part of the world is here. I really like those really bright, kind of electric, purple, blue ones. Yeah, those are the Victor Gorgias. Rotogorgia is still my favorite, though. For morphology, what is this? What did you call it? Pic 
Pictogorgia? Pictogorgia, yeah. Pic How do you spell that? It's still good for uh, 135, probably. Uh, you want 135? Is that good as where we need to go? Uh, pretty much, according to the bathymetry, uh, like 100, 105 should get us to the peak. Oh, yeah. Okay. I want to try that. Then. Okay. You ready? Uh, we'll be soon, yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, you're fine where you are. The current current's doing a fantastic job of managing it for us. I know where it's going. Okay. It's about long to get the Google the right. With the V though. Yeah. Okay. Victor Cord, yeah. like the same sponge we just looked at a second ago, but this one's got a basket star and a crinoid on it. It's got a little coral basically sharing its base with it. So if Old Quarry Middle School is still listening, uh, check your emails we should just have a, a new link being sent out to ensure that this next interaction goes smoothly Ooh, interesting question are corals very sensitive to temperature and seeing as there's no corals nearby hydrothermal vents? Uh, they are absolutely uh, very sensitive to temperature, 100%. Uh, both deep water and shallow water um, kind of live near their thermal extremes. Um, but the, you actually, the reason you don't see corals around hydrothermal vents uh, often isn't the temperature because it cools off very quickly. Um, even though you're dumping hundreds of degrees Celsius water, it mixes so quickly that the thermal signature is really confined to just a couple of meters. Um, the bigger reason you don't see a lot of corals around hydrothermal vents is the rock is generally new. It's growing, okay. and it has other trace minerals and stuff in it that might be toxic to the corals. But if you get off a coral, uh, hydrothermal vent, uh, you often do see coral, some corals, small corals, very nearby, but that's often times because the rock is just not old enough to have grown a, you know, a thousand-year-old coral. Uh, but in the Gulf of Mexico, where you have the cold seeps and the orthogenic carbonates, where the seeps actually form rock, um, they're a really important source for hard grounds for corals to live on. And so you'll see a seep um, that may not have a coral specifically on the rock that's actively seeping, but if you go 10, 15 meters off of the active seep, you'll find older um, seep-derived carbonates that are loaded with corals. Awesome, thank you. I didn't realize there were corals that nearby the cold seeps. So the community seems to be shifting more and more in towards these uh, corallids and and alsamias as we move up here further, and we're seeing fewer of, fewer of the um, soft-bodied octocorals. Looks like it's yeah, dead sponge that, uh, graveyard. Uh, one yeah. zero five move if you want. Bridge nav. 
we move two zero meters, one zero five, please? Thank you. What is that? Zoom in there, Daryl. Zoom in for us, Daryl. It's another dandelion siphonophore. Aww. And it's shedding. I've seen this shedding before, and I've yet to figure out what it is. Can I go wide for a minute? So when you say shedding, what exactly do you mean by or that? We'll see if we if uh, if they can get us a better look. It it drops pieces of itself off, and I I have yet to figure out what it is. But I've seen this once or twice before. Like a phoenix. Rising from the ashes. <laughs> can, uh, do a Except instead of fire, it's extremely cold. So you can see little little things sloughing off, or um, and being blown down current from it. Yeah. Never figure, can't figure out if it's mucus or if it's reproduction or whatever, but. And just a bit more there. Or if it's injured in this current. We saw one last year that was like floating in the water column and just Pushing like shedding yep. tons and tons of, I don't know, mucus or whatever yeah, it is. But I don't know what it is. Wow. I've definitely right. seen this a couple times before and I've not figured out what it's shedding. Yeah, absolutely. That is so interesting. It looks like a nasty spider web, but I definitely don't want to touch that spider web. Yeah, I suspect that might be a bit stingy. <laughs> So this is a, a siphonophore, um, kind of a similar, similar, um, or a relative of like the Portuguese man of war or something like that. If you're on the east coast in the Gulf, you're familiar with those. And spend any time at the coast. So it feeds using its stinging cells. Um, and it's a colonial organism, but with differentiation. So it has different individuals that are technically separate individuals, but they still have a specialization um, in like, the way they contribute to the whole organism. It's a very strange kind of hybrid in terms of uh, life structure when it comes to being individual organisms versus um, colonial organisms. Yeah, it kind of blows my mind that entire sections of animals, plural, can be devoted to reproduction, to food, to locomotion. So it's not just like for animals, but it's like, like you said, colonial. I think we're good, Dan. Thank you. I do. It really is mind boggling to me. Okay. And it's such a simple um, animal. Can go away. Thanks. That's some way, that's how we most of the time you find them is sitting in a rock thing with its tentacles holding on to the seafloor. Lynette, uh, did you say you found one like free floating? Yeah, it was free floating. Um, I think they made like a highlight video of it. If you search Nautilus Live Sea Dandelion you can find it, and it was just like shedding an unbelievable amount of stuff. Like it just kept coming. I don't it know. I don't know if I've ever seen one fully free floating. I'm used to seeing them exactly like that, with a couple tentacles anchoring it to the 
seafloor. That's cool that you saw one fully free swimming. see is again these yellow um, flexi corals that are moving around in the wind and we seem to be dropping out the analsamia but keeping the corelliums as we continue to climb up slope here it may just be this one particular spot is a little bit shifted it may not actually be a community change but So we have a question that I'm a little bit hesitant to ask, but I think I've had this discussion with most of y'all guys. Um, is there a way that deep sea mining can be done without harming the ocean ecosystem? Nope. No. 100% not. Um, it's just, I mean, these are the rocks that you have to take. They're like living things on it, so. So I think that the but any type of mining, more or less, is destructive. Yeah. And so the question is not will it harm or, or not, because it 100% will destroy an epic amount of seafloor and cause massive destruction where you mine. But a strip mine on land does the exact same thing, too. Um, so the question for policymakers is, you know, if we need these resources, um, which there certainly is argument on whether or not there's other technologies in recycling that can be um, no. fill the need for these resources. Sure. I personally am skeptical that um, just new technologies <laughs> yeah, let and me get recycling another 10 is minutes. enough um, to meet the needs of some of these but things. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. But, so I think we're going to have to mine them from somewhere, um, whether that's the deep sea, the rainforest, or asteroids. Um, is really a question of which is the lesser of all the evils uh, and which is frankly financially viable and that's the question at hand I think um, because you know in or extracting these rare earth minerals is wildly destructive no matter where you do it yeah like moving mountains into valleys to get coral yep. or moving hundreds of feet of overburden in, in Alaska to get exactly um, and you know it all flows downhill. So it, even if you're using super toxic chemicals in rainforests, it's going a lot of it's going to end up in the ocean anyways. Um, so don't be wrong. I, I'm not a fan of deep sea mining, and I'm not looking forward to it. But I'm not. I'm also I feel like realistic enough to realize that if we're going to deal with climate change, we need a lot of these specialized minerals, and they got to come from somewhere. Um, and the hard part is where are they going to come from in order to decarbonize. And if it requires giving up some sections of abyssal plain to do manganese harvesting in order to get us to prevent some of the absolute catastrophic possibilities of climate change, then maybe that's a, a cost worth paying. I don't know, though. But wherever deep sea mining occurs, it is going to be wildly destructive. And if you start crust mining, um, you're literally going to peel the top meter of everything you're seeing here off and kill everything living on it and cause sediment plumes that may go miles or more yeah. and bury everything else nearby as well. So it's going to be wildly yeah. destructive. That's the kind of difference between anything land-based versus anything ocean-based. Land-based, you kind of have this 2D grid that you're working on, but anything in the ocean, you have this 3D grid because you're thinking about the whole entire water column. So it's like anything in all, in all directions is kind of fair game. Yeah, think of a mine in an arid environment with no dust mitigation plan where everything they kick up blows in the wind for miles and, and multiply that by 10 or 100 yeah and you get well, what what's going to happen in the ocean these sediment plumes and the sediment down here in the deep sea is often extremely fine and will float for a long long period of time and can move 
we don't really know how far yet, but certainly a very significant a distance. So a couple of years ago, yeah, we I had so. um, a scientist from ONC who was looking for her PhD, was looking into harvesting like extinct or dead hydrothermal vents. Is that a possibility? Certainly, I mean, that's generally that's getting sulfides and stuff like that more it's than then like crusher nodules, yep. but it's the same kind of issue. Okay. Um, but it would be mainly the difference is two different minerals are being harvested. Yeah. So the thing, the reason why people are very interested in mining crusts and nodules is because they have a very high concentration of cobalt, which is extremely important in lithium ion batteries and is coming very, very depleted on land. Um, and there's a lot of human rights violations around uh, land-based mining of cobalt so those are some of the reasons why people are looking to the deep sea um but yeah but it's the same thing and i'm as far as i know there's not these kind of crazy dense coral ecosystems around hydrothermal vents but there are very dense um important ecosystems around hydrothermal vents as well they might not be as pretty as this but there's a lot of really important microbes um and snails, mm -hmm. um, Pompeii worms, tube worms. Yeah, that live in these those ecosystems as well. But I think actually the deep sea mining that's currently happening right now, I think they are actually mining for seafloor massive sulfides. So there's no okay. large scale mining of cruster nodules yet. Um, but I think Japan is mining for sulfides now. But it could start as soon as July the this year. Yeah, wow. July is when it's coming up. I think um, All Seas has been picking up modules. Yeah, All Seas, in partnership with the metals company, has done a, a, a full-scale extractive test. They pulled up like 3,000 tons or something like that wow. this year. Um, One of the things to consider with um, Mining from a ship versus mining from land is the infrastructure required. Yeah. So for a land-based mine, they all the infrastructure, machinery, buildings, housing, all that is um, kind of a one-time use only. So you see a lot of abandoned mines, and all the um, time and money and energy expended to um, build all that infrastructure is then, you know kind of waste after that with um, mining from a vessel. The vessel uh, can be repurposed to, you know, just move to another location. Yeah. So I think the, the short answer is it's wildly complicated. Yeah. And the devil is really in the details and the nuance of, you know, how, where do you release your sediment plumes? How much, um, what is the average, you know, size of the, um, the particle released and things like that are going to actually have a huge effect on how destructive um, deep sea mining is. Um, and I will say, from my point of view at least, the International Seabed Authority, which regulates mining on the high seas, um, is not doing a very good job of, of working through um, kind of the details of what's going to happen. That was really great information and a great discussion. Thank y'all. This is another one of the hemichoralliums we've been seeing quite a bit with some tissue lost in the center and a bunch of crinoids using it as uh, to get up in the water column. The overall density of the coral we're seeing here seems to be thinning out um, as we move further up this kind of ridge back, approaching a, oh, a, I don't want to call it a local high because it's more than just like where we're with the vehicle seeing, but this um, knoll, call it a knoll, the top of the knoll. Um, here's another stalked crinoid, which have been kind of rare for this dive. There's a little anthemastus in the background. But a bamboo coral whip here. Uh, oh, let me get another 10 here. Let's see what happens. Can 
you play with the um, gain on that sonar there and see if you can get it uh, the DB there where it says 11. You can, this guy here, you can play with that a little bit. He should be getting just a bit of a more return there. So I'm not sure which way to go to bend it. The uh, numbers there to you it's, it should be on the same range, but the, after you tilted it down there, it should be. Maybe it's just seeing that is what's try dropping the range. Let's uh, hold off on the move just for a minute. We so we'll get the, into a little steeper here. spot here. We've got at a little wall. Still got a couple of the rock pens, the hemicralliums, paramarissias. You have five. Okay. I notice you're still ascending. You want me to just match you for a bit? Uh, no, I'm just backing up here to get an overview. I can't Copy that. Decide which way I want to go. Now I get it. Still seeing a really pretty strong current flow as we watch this whip vibrate in the current. again, I guess. Mm, sure. I can slide up the hill a bit. Nice, pretty wall sponge here on the left. We've seen a one or two dead ones lower down, but this is the first live healthy one I think I've seen. Push in there and do it. Got a shrimp associate and a couple bristles, br bristle, brittle stars in there. Ooh, that is a pretty, pretty, pretty one. We haven't seen that guy yet. Not on this dive, no. I think one of the one of the dead ones we saw lower down was a dead wow. one. But there's a cup coral in the background there under that paramarcia back there. All right, thank you. Okay, go go away. Thanks. Like that sponge. Yeah, so pretty. Mm -hmm. 
So the area that we're diving on now, do we believe that this was once upon a time an island or do we think that it never broke the surface? Or is it unknown? Oh, I see. This one is a little less clear, frankly. Yeah, the, what's interesting is that the flat geo area that we would normally assume had broke the surface is actually deeper mm -hmm. um, than what we're diving on right now. This, this one does not exactly hold the kind of the classic look of a, a geo, and I don't have an explanation for it. Yeah, I'm going to push that question to Adam. <laughs> Thank you. Can we look at the snow white one? Please? Sure. Yep, this is another type of crowd. All right, thank you. Okay, I can go away. Yep, a sock goes in Scotland too. Everybody, everybody in the science chat who's a biologist is uh, in Scotland this week. <laughs> I had to pre-record my talk before we left. What was your talk on? Uh, it's on a, it was comparing the coral communities on different flanks of a seamount in the Phoenix Islands, about a thousand miles west of here, and a little bit south, actually mm. a lot of it south, on the other side of the equator. Actually, a lot of the data I showed on the, the transit down here was from that project. Missed my graduation to be out here. Missed conference. Are you sad? No, not really. I'd, <laughs> rather, I'd way rather be out here. Yes, and your first uh, lead scientist gig. Yep. It's exciting. Congrats on that, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> I spent too much time expedition coordinating and expedition leading when I was with NOAA that it doesn't feel all that weird to me. You're probably doing like less work now I'm absolutely doing than you were before. 100% <laughs> less work. I feel really guilty watching Dwight running around doing all the logistic <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, not my job, the screws. <laughs> Come up just uh, five meters for me. Copy that, hauling in five. So as a former expedition leader and as a science lead, is there a particular depth that you like to work at? It really, no. Short answer is no. Um, I would say below 3,000 meters is pretty boring. Um, but um, I just, probably this area, somewhere between like 1,600 and 600 is probably my favorite kind of depth range. If you get sh once you get start getting shallower, you start picking up mesophotic things, and, um, and it's a really a different community in the shallower water that I'm just not as familiar with. Um, but yeah, this this kind of depth range um, I really like the 1800, 800, 1600. So yeah. What is uh, mesophobic? Meso mesophotic. Oh, mesophotic. Yep, Twilight Zone. Yeah. I thought it was uh, afraid of Twilight there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you got five meters up. Right. What is that? 
Can we look at this, please? Sure. Uh, go ahead, Tom. Sneak in to the fans here. Uh, which one are we after? Right? Uh, the one that's coming out of, falling out of um, frame to the top. The whitish, bushy right. one. That one. Yep. That's some type of black coral. You can push in a bit more if you want. Yeah. Yeah, definitely an anthropotherian of some type, um, but I don't know. I can't get it past black coral for now. I'll have to look that one up later. Th but that should be good for a reference for later. Thank you. Okay, can, let me just load up. Here. Hey there, Christopher Klaus. Good to see you're joining us. And welcome to all the sixth graders from Marlboro uh, Middle School. Okay. That's a, yeah. I'm, like yeah, I'm like wonder, I'm wondering like why only some of these rocks are oxidized. If it was just this one, then I would say this is fallen, but there's a couple of them. But I don't know why it's just in this area. Should we snag one? So you can look at it on deck? You know what? Sure. I haven't... I've been very... not wanting to make rock collections, but maybe... I don't even know where it is, though. Really angular one back there behind the coral. There is like this really oxidized one that was kind of back where we were before that I could see in the still camera image. Is this one? Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure which one. Uh, I think it might be over to the left. I'm looking for a very brown rock. Kind of rust colored. You'll have to circle it on colorblind and we, look we, brown we to me. We don't see it right now. <laughs> We're looking. Oh, if it's too difficult, I'm sure we'll see it again. Or not, but who cares. I can backtrack. I have the technology. basically where we were sitting looking at that white coral we just zoomed in on. It was in the foreground. Can you bring up the still that had it in it again? Mm -hmm. It was uh, somewhere in here, wasn't it? Yeah, because that looks like, oh, the, yeah, there that it looks is. like the black. There, there it is. I think we're talking yep. about this one right there. Right there. Good eyes. So Corley, what's the significance of this oxidized rock? Well, it's just weird because none of the other rocks are oxidized. It's just like this little patch, if you can see, there's like that main one and then kind of to the right of it, there's like a little patch that's also oxidized and then to the right of that, there's a rock that's the top of it is oxidized. So it's a little bit weird because yeah, not a half zoom to cover that area. 